Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Cindy Nagel from Horizon Dental. I'm back for the slightly late October edition of Tip Tuesday. Uh, I didn't want to do one uh, on Halloween because I was assuming most people would be busy with their trick-or-treating, um, as was I, handing out candy. So um, I will be back again at the end of November to kind of catch up on things. Anyways, um, today's topic for Tip Tuesday is about uh, the difference between amalgam versus composite or white dental fillings um, and about some of the controversy that sort of surrounds these, these topics, these materials. So hopefully uh, everybody finds something interesting here. Uh, if you have any questions, I think I can see the feed properly, so I'll try to answer them as we go. And of course, uh, all the videos and everything will be available. I'll mention all the links at the end of the video. So, um, anyways, I did want to say uh, a big thank you to Aisha Peacock. She inspired this uh, video, this Tip Tuesday, by sending me um, a link to an article on a health website about the toxic effects of amalgam fillings, and she was interested on my thoughts on that, which I was really excited about. So I dove deep into the research, uh, maybe a little too deep, and uh, came up with enough material to do Tip Tuesday. So here we go. Um, I wanted to first talk about um, the differences between the amalgam and the white fillings. So um, the amalgam or the silver fillings, they actually do have silver in them. They also have a combination of tin and copper metals and are typically about 50% liquid mercury. So that's where the term amalgam comes from because the mercury binds the metals together and hardens everything into this amalgamation, um, which is the proper name for it. Um, the, on the other hand, the composite or the resin fillings, they um, are made up of a combination of a liquid resin, um, which is the binder, like the liquid mercury, and also filler materials like silica or zirconia or other kind of glass um, or like acrylic materials. Um, and there's lots and lots of different varieties of those, so <laughs> I'm not going to go into too many details. But that's where the name composite comes from as well, because it is a blend of these different materials. So. Um, that's the basic difference between them. Uh, and now I'm just gonna dive deep into the actual controversy because this is sort of the fun part. Um, but uh, we know that um, these amalgam fillings, the tin and mercury combination for them, it's been around since about uh, 600 AD. They were first used in China and were introduced to like Western medicine, Western dentistry in the early 1800s. And pretty much right away, um, people started fighting about it. And honestly, I'm hoping to either find a book or write a book about this because there have been three amalgam wars <laughs> over the last 200 years. And I'm absolutely fascinated by the idea of there being a war about this stuff. Um, and of course, you know, war being a, a silly term for it, but more like a fight, I guess. But um, basically, it seems that there's always been groups of like pro-amalgam and anti-amalgam dentists for many, many different reasons. And a lot of these wars sort of um, surrounded the idea that um, some dentists believed that other dentists were poisoning their patients or that they were doing something wrong. So this, this controversy has been around since the beginning, and it's absolutely fascinating. Um, of course, these days, medicine and dentistry, we're meant to use, um, you know, evidence-based research to figure out how to best serve our patients. And believe me, there is a lot of research about this because um, mercury is a toxin. And that's what it comes down to. So I have a list here of diseases that have been medically linked to mercury. Um, things like brain damage, um, multiple sclerosis is a big one, um, Crohn's disease and other ulcers, digestive problems like that, um, potentially Alzheimer's, and also a few random things like um, low blood pressure, depression, a high heart rate or a tachycardia, and also some cancers. But what I need to be super clear about is that the connection between these diseases is with mercury. It's not with amalgam. It's not with dental fillings. And there's a big difference between the two. Any of those connections or those correlations that have been made in any of the research that I could find, um, it was all what we call anecdotal. It was self-reported. So what happens is that, um, hi Sherry, 
Um, people will have a disease or something wrong and they'll have those amalgam, those silver fillings removed and replaced with something different. And what they find is that they feel better, so their symptoms improve. So while I definitely don't want to say that there is absolutely no connection there, um, what we can't say is that there is a connection. So it's this wonderful gray area that we just can't quite, uh, we can't quite agree upon. Um, we also know that mercury is released naturally in our environment. It's released from the earth. It's released from the oceans. And of course, it's released by humans and our wonderful uh, activities that sadly kind of poison our environment and, and contribute probably the most to any sort of mercury exposure. One of the uh, kind of more interesting things that I came across in that original article that inspired this Tip Tuesday was that um, there was a high incidence of these diseases linked to children who were working in gold mines in Africa. And that's where they discovered, you know, some of the brain diseases or neurological problems that can come up in children who are exposed to mercury, which, which is really, really sad. But again, it's, it's environmental, it's in mining, it doesn't have anything to do with the amalgam fillings themselves. So, um, when we're actually looking at amalgam itself, you know, doing the research to try and figure out if there is any kind of toxicity with the amalgams, what we find is that it's really hard to measure the amount of amalgam or pardon me, the amount of mercury that's released from the filling materials. Um, it's just such a small environment. There's so many other factors that are going on. We just don't have a great way of measuring it. The measurements that we do get um, show that the amount of mercury that is released is is either negligible or or can't be measured. Um, the only time when it is measurable seems to be when the amalgam is being placed in your mouth, and that's of course when it's in that liquid form. And what we what we do when we place it is that we're condensing it so that the material can harden and can you know form properly, and that does release um, some vapors of mercury. That's why in dentistry we have these big high volume sections so that we can suck that up right away so that it doesn't get anywhere, and why dentists like myself use the rubber dam to protect your, your mouth and your tissues from having any exposure like that. So there's ways that we've come up with that help protect both us and our patients, um, but even even so, the amount of mercury that's released um, during placement of the amalgam fillings is still seems to be within you know what they call um, safe limits. So, all I can say is that it's clear that there isn't a connection between diseases and amalgams, but it's also clear that we don't have as much information as we would like. So. Um, the next point that I have on my, my little list of things <laughs> I'm using to kind of move along here is that um, one thought that came to mind for myself was that a lot of these people, the conspiracy theorists that think that, um, you know, we're ignoring evidence that shows that amalgam is related to these diseases. Um, I was wondering what reasons they would think that the associations would want to keep that a secret because amalgam is less expensive than composite materials. So when I'm placing uh, a white filling, that material is more expensive, hence the filling does cost a little bit more compared to, say, if I was to do one with the silver material. Um, so we're not making more money off of it which is usually the reason why people would lie about something like this. Uh, and the other thing that came to mind for me as well is that, you know, uh, dentists would be exposed more often to amalgam than any of our patients would be. So you would think that dentists and dental assistants would have a higher incidence of these diseases or would have other signs of toxicity um, that, you know, we could, that we could measure or that we could, take some sort of, of research evidence from. And there is nothing out there, so far as I could find, that supported any of that. So that made me feel a lot better. <laughs> um, so why do some dentists still use amalgam? Uh, it's a great question. And um, there's many, many different reasons, of course. We, we all do what we believe is right. And sometimes it does come down to the cost. So like I mentioned a few minutes ago, it is a less expensive material. So it does allow us to help our patients save some money sometimes. And often that is a big help. Dentistry is expensive, we know. <laughs> um, it's also easier to place. Um, so it's, you don't have to um, 
be as, as diligent with a dry environment either. So um, we don't have to do as much suction. It's okay if a little bit of saliva or blood gets in there, whereas if we're placing the white, the composite materials, they have to stay dry. Um, and there's also, um, you know, a lot more evidence around how long amalgam lasts, but I believe that's because it's been around for so much longer. Um, composites haven't really come into their own until the last, you know, probably 10, 20 years, and amalgam has been around for 200. So, of course, there's going to be uh, a higher success rate, historically speaking, in that regard. Um, I also know that there's a lot of dentists that still believe that um, the amalgam is better for children or people that have a high risk of getting more cavities because partly that that um, historical evidence that it lasts longer um, but also because it is easier to place and it's easier to replace than the white filling materials so um, lots and lots of reasons behind it um, and people that use it use it well and it does serve a purpose in, in some cases, for sure. Um, I mentioned before, like some of the downsides to using the composite, some of the things that I struggle with, of course, is uh, that wonderful dry environment because the mouth is not a dry place. So of course, there's always lots of suction and we're you know constantly separating things. We, we have to use the rubber dam, which isn't always a fun part of dentistry either. It is um, also, more expensive, I mentioned that, and um, there was some concern in recent years about um, BPA, which um, you know was being released from water bottles and Tupperware and all kinds of things like that. Um, and some of our materials do have BPA in them, um, but a lot of our materials don't. So if you have concerns about BPA, have a sensitivity, or have questions, just ask your dentist about the materials. We always have a list. Um, so we should be able to answer that. I know that my materials don't because I specifically looked for it. <laughs> um, there's lots of uh, upsides to using the composites as well. Um, obviously they look better, so we try to match the color uh, as best we can to your natural tooth. Um, they're also bonded. So the composite, when we're placing amalgam fillings, um, for example, we have to make the tooth a certain shape so that it can hold that filling in place. We're using a lot of mechanical retention. Um, and when we're using the composite fillings, because we can bond or you know micro adhere <laughs> them to the tooth itself, we can be a lot more conservative. So I don't have to take away tooth structure to create this kind of shape. I can just make a, a slightly smaller shape that conserves more tooth and and allows me to to still place a, a really excellent filling that won't fall out so that's a that's a big one for me oh, thank you leanne i'm glad that you're finding it good in for all the information good i i hope i'm not going too fast um i also wanted to mention that there are some types of these resin materials that can release fluoride or other ions that can actually strengthen the tooth which is very exciting again for myself because we're always especially in kids and people who are at a high risk for getting cavities we want to make sure that we're doing what we can to support them and to make sure that they don't get cavities again and a lot of that does come down to you know the things that you do at home um, you know your oral hygiene brushing flossing etc your diet um, but some of it can be aided by the kinds of materials that we have John has a question. New options coming in place of composite to replace amalgam. There's tons and tons of different things out there that have come up. Um, I've been playing with uh, another material that's um, classified as what we call a bioactive material. And um, that is a closer cousin to what I just mentioned with the ions and the fluoride release because it's, uh, it's like I said, bioactive. It's a biocompatible material. So without using a separate bonding agent it'll naturally adhere to the tooth and we know that when we do adhesion properly we can reinforce and we can strengthen the tooth so whereas with amalgam a lot of the time we're taking a lot of tooth away and we're not we're and the filling itself is strong we're not actually reinforcing the tooth as well as we could with some of these other materials um, and of course, sometimes depending on the size of the cavity or the size of the old filling, it's better to use 
either an onlay, an inlay, or a crown to fully support the tooth so that it doesn't break apart and it isn't weakened by these large fillings. So lots and lots of different options, which is, again, exciting for me. I mean, a lot of dentists find fillings to be really boring because it's kind of, uh, you know, bread and butter dentistry, but there's so many different options and there's so many materials out there that there's just a never-ending source of, uh, of entertaining research to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's the geek in me just just trying to love my job. Um, so my last point, of course, is why don't I use amalgam? I have been amalgam free for about four years now, and a lot of that it's it's got nothing to do with the toxicity. And again, the research doesn't support the idea that it's toxic, but it can't. 100% disprove the toxicity either. So when it comes to the actual um, conspiracy, the controversy that I mentioned, I'm kind of on the fence, but I feel as though I don't have to take uh, a stance because I have materials that I can work with that I don't need to rely on the amalgam. And, and, and in that way, I feel like I'm a little bit ahead of the game. And the reasons that I don't use it are because it is outdated. We have other options. We have better options now that we can use for, for children, for, for elderly people, people who have high risk uh, for getting cavities, people with low risk. It, it works just the same. Um, and, you know, when it comes to conservation of tooth structure, you can never underestimate that because um, what I do see happening in a lot of people over time is that um, the tooth itself will actually start to break apart around amalgam fillings. I very rarely see that around the white, the composite fillings because of that bonding that I talked about. But I do see that people who have older amalgam fillings, their teeth will start to break. And once a piece of it breaks off, sometimes it, there's still enough tooth there that we can use that bonding and we can play with it and we can get the tooth to hold that filling in place. But sometimes enough of it breaks off where you have to upgrade to that crown, to that full coverage to fully protect the tooth. Um, and I would prefer, again, to be as conservative as possible, to use the materials that I have at hand to recharge teeth, to support the body's natural ability to, to heal itself and to, to do these sorts of things. Um, you know, I like the idea of being a holistic dentist where we're looking at the big picture and we're letting the body do what it can and what it needs to do. So that comes, that takes me to the end of Tip Tuesday for this month. <laughs> um, I don't yet have a topic chosen for the end of November, um, but as soon as I do, I will be creating another Facebook event so that everybody knows um, when to tune in. Um, again, the video will be available on our Facebook page, my YouTube channel, and through our website at www horizondental.clinic. Um, thank you everybody who watched. Thank you so much everybody who commented. And if any of you have any other comments or questions, I will do my best to answer them in the comments below. And if you have any suggestions on any topics that you'd like to know about uh, for dentistry in general, um, definitely please contact me. Thank you very much. Uh, good night.